Deshaun, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for asking and thank you for having me on today. My pleasure. I'm glad you could be here. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's just jump right in. Tell us a little about yourself and what you do these days. So uh, my name is Deshaun Williams. I am actually an ordained minister through Universal uh, Life Church. Um, it's a funny story behind it. Um, we can, we can discuss that as well, (laughs) but, uh, along with that, I'm an author of seven, getting ready to be eight books, um, podcast hosts, and I'm also a mental health and suicide prevention advocate. And, uh, I'm also a transformation coach and public speaker. Sounds like you've got a lot on your plate. That I do. Oh, and I'm a husband to be. So, yeah. Well, congratulations. When's the big day? That we have not decided yet. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. Deshaun, you've had a lot of challenges and obstacles that you've had to overcome to get where you are. Let's talk about some of them. Let's talk about ADHD to begin with. How has that been an obstacle in your life? ADHD uh, (laughs) has been an obstacle because um, I'm, I'm, well, technically I wouldn't call it an obstacle, but it does bring its challenges. So, you know, having all these different things that I, that I pursue, all these different things that I do, um, there's times where it's like, okay, I want to do this. And then when I feel like it's, so I always say I'm a, I am, I'm my own biggest critic, but also at the same time, you know, I'm the hardest person to please when it comes to myself. And if Mm -hmm. the name doesn't seem right, I'll change it. If I feel like it's off, I'll change it. If a project that I'm working on, um, even if I've just started it two days ago and I feel like, oh, this is not going to work, I'll change it. And I will stop the entire direction and I will do a whole 180 of being like, okay, what can I do now? And so, you know, it, it has its, it has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. So the short attention span, uh, as you, and you know, just me moving around like I am right now. And, uh, and just constantly either having to have something in my hand or, uh, just looking away. And it's, it's always something because most people think I'm not paying attention or I'm not listening. It's like, I am, uh, I just have to have something for a minor distraction. So that's how ADHD has played a part in my life. You know, there's something to be said, though, about a willingness to change, because I've worked with people, you know, 20 plus years now, and as a minister that's been serving in a congregation, and, you know, it's true that people can dig in, and stereotypes don't serve any of us well. Uh, There's a stereotype that church people don't change, but that's not entirely true. I've seen people make remarkable changes and transformation in their lives. But there is a human tendency to want to dig in and to resist doing something different. So I'm sure that that switching, you know, can cause its own challenges and obstacles in your life. But also it gives you a freedom to not dig in and to get bogged down by an idea that's not working for you. Yes, ma'am. That that is true. Um... You know, so many people, it's like, oh, you've, like, big example. You know, I said I'm a transformation coach. I actually started out as a confidence coach. And I've went down the line. It's like, okay, this is this is what I focus on. This is what I didn't focus on. And now 
So ADHD also played a part in that as well because I had it helped me realize what it was that I was focusing on a lot. Yeah. So what is, what are some other challenges that you've faced in your life? Um, you know, I, I faced I faced a lot. Um, uh, some better than others. Um, some worse than others. Um, one challenge that I have faced growing up was, um, you know, I was raised by my grandparents, um, and being raised by my grandparents, that meant that, um, that meant I was a ward of the state. So I was actually taken, um, from my mom, who is now technically my sister, uh, cause my grandparents adopted me. And so, um, you know, being taken from my mom at the age of three years old and me and my brother uh, being separated, him going to go stay with, um, like my brother went to go stay with his father. Um, they couldn't figure out who my father was because we've we've done over 16 DNA tests and all of them have came back negative. So mm-hmm. it, it's definitely been, that was a challenge uh, growing up because, you know, going to school and they have the, uh, they have the parent, they have where the parents can come to school. And both of my grandparents um, were disabled. Now, granted, my, now, not granted, but unfortunately, my grandfather did pass away when I was in seventh grade. Um, and that left me and my grandmother. Uh, she's disabled. She's not allowed to drive because of her health uh, mm-hmm. conditions. So, you know, continuing to go through school that you have, um, even watching my cousins, watching their mom come, who was my, aunt, who's my aunt, and just realizing I have no one that can, that will show up for me. Um, it always, it always made me feel like I was less than everyone else because, you know, everyone, um, uh, everyone's out and they're, they're laughing, they're enjoying time. And then there's me who's just kind of in the corner, but it also helped me realize, you know, um, I've come in contact with people who say, oh, I wish, um, I wish that my dad was never here because he doesn't do this or he doesn't do that. Or I wish my mom, um, wasn't here and things of that nature. And it makes me realize, you know, that, and I've told them, it's like, um, y'all, y'all are lucky to have either one of both parents in your life. There's some of us who don't. And granted, my, my grandparents were my, they were my parents, but to actually have a relationship with the person who gave birth to you and knowing that as you grow up, you'll never have that, you'll never have that close knitted relationship. Like, you see everyone else have that that's that's very heartbreaking um but it was something that i had to understand because that while they didn't while they couldn't teach me while my the parents who gave birth to me while they could not teach me what it took to become an adult they taught me what it took not so they pretty much taught me what not to do as an adult and what not to do when when it's time for me to become a parent. I appreciate your mindset on that, that you've taken it and you've made something of yourself. You've made quite a bit of yourself, honestly, and you're taking those challenges, those things that you lacked, and you're making it something to step forward and step higher with. And I really admire that about you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. What would you say is the biggest challenge you faced? Huh. Biggest challenge I faced? Depression. Um, I've always suffered from depression. Um, to this day, I still do. Uh, it's just not as bad as it once was. So um, I always tell people that 2018 was the biggest year for depression um, because I tried to take my own life. Um, and you know, that was, 
So that was September. The date, I believe, was September 23rd, 2018. And uh, it was a Saturday. And I just remember laying in bed. I, I was 20 years old, I think. Yeah, I was 20 years old. Um, and it's like, okay, nothing's going right. At the time I was actually, so I had a, I was engaged then. So I was engaged at 20, um, which I feel like I was a little too young to be engaged at now. Um, but I was engaged. Um, I was working, uh, almost 70 hours a week, roughly 68 to 70 hours a week, trying to, trying to go to college trying to maintain a social life. It just didn't work. Um, and everything started going um, downhill. So the first thing to go was the relationship. Um, when that went, I was like, okay, something's going on. Something, Something's going on. Don't know what it is, but it's not me. Um, that That's just how I felt like it's not me. Whatever it is, it's not me. Okay. Um, then on top of that, you know, I'm getting, I was getting ready to realize, I was realizing that it was the anniversary of my, um, my grandfather's passing. I had just lost another friend of mine to, uh, accidental overdose. So it, it was just September of that year was just, uh, just a hard month, uh, to be honest. And, uh, so after, after the failed engagement, you know, the, the next thing to go was uh, college because I didn't want to go to college. I'm working anywhere between eight to 16 hour shifts. The last thing I want to do was mm-hmm. go to college uh, because I barely had enough time to sleep. And uh, so when it came down to it, it was like, OK, college is out the door. And then everyone was like, oh, well, you know, you don't have anything else to do. So now you can pick up more hours. So, you know, I I, I thought about it and it's like, hmm, pick up more hours, make more money and pay off my car faster. Because granted, I, I was young. I was dumb. I had a car that was paid for and I traded it then. I got a car that had a part that had a car payment. I don't sure. um, advise anyone to go out and do that if it's paid for. Correct. But we've all done that, right? <laughs> yes. L- lesson learned. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it was right when I got time to, uh, right when I was asked, hey, can you pick up more hours? And I didn't give them a definite answer. They told me it was like, go home. Uh, think about it. Let us know Monday when you come in. So that night when I went home, it was September 23rd. That was the night that I ultimately tried to commit suicide. Um, most, a lot of people have asked me, they was like, how did you try? Did you try to cut your wrist? Did you try to hang yourself? Did you try to overdose on pills? The answer was no to all of those. The Surprisingly, most people wouldn't think this, but it was more of um, me pulling out the gun that I had at the time and trying to shoot myself in the head and it malfunctioned. And um, mm-hmm. so, you know, at, the, at that point, I laid down, I cried, and I went to sleep. The next day, uh, cause I, I'm a church goer and, you know, I went to church and, uh, there's, I've never had anyone just walk up to me and be like, you look like total crap. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> and it was like, what's wrong? Well, I didn't get any sleep last night. I tried to commit suicide. And it was like, wow. Well, I just feel like I don't belong here anymore. I'm just tired. And. You know, we just kind of left the, the conversation at that. That was like, we'll pray for you. And that was the conversation. So, you know, I didn't think anything about it. 
in my mind, you know, this is a normal conversation. This is something that we talk about daily. It's something that just gets brought up. <laughs> At Tuesday, uh, we have what is called rally. So I'll go to a church named New Spring. It's big here in South Carolina. And um, rally is for 18 to 25 year olds. Um, so young adults in college. And while I was not in college, I was still age. I was still within the age limit to uh, go. So I went, took a picture before the event, uh, before the church service at night. And, you know, I'm in front of the car that I'm paying on and I'm and I, I'm hitting a dab in the photo and I got a hand pointing up to the sky and uh, nothing looks nothing looks wrong. I got on the shirt that I was a brand ambassador for. and you would have never thought anything was wrong. I went through that entire service that night thinking, hey, I can make it through. I can make it through and nothing will stop me. And, you know, I made it to that service. Uh, I showed little to no emotion during that service. Even though it touched me, I showed no emotion during that service because I knew if I did, um, I would bust out crying. So the best thing to do is show no emotion. Um, I go home because I drove myself. That's how out of touch I was with everyone. I would drive myself two places and drive myself back. So go back in to work that Wednesday, work 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And get off work, come home. I get a text message from one of the leaders inside the church. Hey, you coming to, you coming tonight? Cause you scheduled to volunteer. Yeah, I'll be there tonight. We need to talk. Talk about what? So, you know, in my mind, like, mm-hmm. I know, what you, I know what you want. I know what you want to talk about, but I want to play it off. I want to act like I don't know what you want to talk about because I don't want to, this is something, this is the elephant in the room that I don't want to confront. Let's just keep the elephant in the room. And um, yeah. I went that night before the service got started. So we've, we've done our run through of the service and everything before the, um, the middle school, before the middle school and high school students come in. And uh, we're having our, we're doing our prayer. And right after the prayer, they pulled me aside. It's like, we need to talk. It's like, about what and he goes into detail about hey so i heard you try to do this and i'm just standing there looking away from him now with my phone in my hand just scrolling because this isn't a conversation mm-hmm. i want to have and you know i'm I'm getting told like hey um we have no option like you have to get help i've mm-hmm. I've been getting, I had literally received help from the day I was born from a mental health therapist. So I didn't want to go get help from another therapist. And so I was like, I'm not going to a therapist. Oh, no, you're not going to a therapist. No, you're going to a hospital. Which hospital do you want to go to? Hmm. So I choose the hospital that was local to me. And I was like, I'll drive myself there after the service. Oh, no, you're not driving there. We're taking you. Huh? You're taking me? It's like, yeah, we're going to take you. And so it's like, okay. So my car is parked behind the church after the service. We're dri- <laughs> me and the person that actually baptized me is actually driving me up to the hospital. Um, while, when we get to the hospital and everything, um, get checked in. And I, I still find it odd that they called the the room that I stayed in the hospital pod. I don't know why they call it a pod. It still intrigues me to this day because it was a room. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, I had to stay there. I had to stay in that ER room overnight. And the next day they take me and seven other people up to the second floor. So we're walking up because we're not taking elevators. We're walking up to the second floor. And it's like, welcome to the, to the site ward. Oh, so I'm on the crazy floor, huh? It's the first thing that went to my mind. I'm on the crazy floor. 
Uh, granted, I never let that come out of my mouth because uh, I was afraid of what might happen if I did. Uh, and it was like, Mr. Williams, this is your room. Now, granted, I have nothing but the hospital gown that they have given me. Nothing else. No clothes. Nothing. So I go to the room. I lay down. I go back to sleep. I sleep, I think, for about four hours before I hear a buzz come into the room over the intercom saying, Mr. Williams, you can't sleep all day. If you want to get out of the hospital, then you have to interact. Me, being the ignorant person I was at the time, I don't want to, I don't want to interact with anyone. I don't want y'all to mess with me. Please leave me alone. All I want to do is sleep. I mean, I was tired. I've I'm working almost 70 mm-hmm. hours a week. I'm tired. Like, please let me sleep. And I was like, this is part of the requirement. You have to interact if you want to get out. At that point, it's like, oh, how long do I have to interact before I can, before I can be released? It was, I can, like, it was like, can oh, I go whenever, say hi? Do I have to have a conversation? <laughs> right. And so it was like, whenever the therapist feel like you're good to go home, it's like, there could be a day. There could be two months. I went by to be in the hospital for two months. I can tell you that now. Mm-hmm. So I left out the room, went to the family room, and started interacting with everyone. Hey, 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 how y'all doing? My name is such and such. And, and uh, I tried to head back to my room. That's like, nope. Uh, y'all got the therapy mm-hmm. session now. Okay. So therapy session there, going over the three levels of depression. Your minor, your moderate, your major. Everyone in the room, minor or moderate. Then there's me, major. And I was like, oh, I'm just an eyeball out, huh? And I was like, well, yeah. So during all this time in the in the hospital, I'm I'm in the room. I'm in my room just trying to figure out like what can I do? Why is the shower not staying on for longer than 30 seconds? Why is the sink not staying on for longer than 30 seconds? And finally, I can get a phone call. So I call my grandmother. Hey, I'm in the hospital. I need some clothes because I'm tired of wearing this gown. Um, And I need some <laughs> shoes. I need some socks because I'm tired of walking around. These little slippery, these little slippery socks. Um, They good, but the little grippy socks, don't, they don't fit me. So, um. And so, so my grandmother, uh, she calls her daughter. They come up, they bring me clothes. And um, it was just one thing after another. Uh, you know, we actually had a decent conversation. And uh, after they left, I went back to the room because visiting hours, I think, was like from 6 to 7. So uh, we had to be in bed by 10 o'clock. So I went back to my room before um, before it was like our little hour of free time and so um i went in there got dressed it's seven o'clock it's seven o'clock at night why do i need to get dressed right but i got dressed um walked back out and in the app watching tv and they were like mr williams it's time for your medicine I was on the depression medicine and I was on the sleeper medication. Two medications that interacted and interfered with each other because the depression medicine kept you up. Sleeper medicine made you sleep. And so there was like one is going to do the opposite of the other. I was like, okay. And um, with that being said, it was just, it was wild because the next day, um, it was like October. So at this point, it's October 5th. And um, I'm in the room crying because I was supposed to be at this event um, that I went to every year. They would shoot off fireworks and I was supposed to be at it. And I just couldn't go. And I was crying. And I was like, okay, I have to figure something out. I have to get out of here because I cannot take this any longer. Um. Well, I ended up standing there for about four more days. And the final day that I was in the hospital, 
the therapist comes and talks to me. And she says, Mr. Williams. Yes. So you know that you have major depression. Yes, ma'am. You're not going to be able to be as successful as some people who have mild and moderate depression. Okay. We also want to let you know your health insurance declined. You have a $19,000 medical bill. Oh, no. You know, interesting being told that you have a bill that high, especially when you're in the hospital for for depression. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And by and the so, way, it's major. Right. I, I, you know, y'all, could, I could leave at this hospital and come right back in because y'all done told me this. Um, but I got released that day. Um, I had to wait for a family member to come pick me up from the hospital and take me to the church so I could get my car. I was so glad that nobody stole my car because my keys were sitting in the admission. They had literally put my key in the admission. And so I drove mm-hmm. home with like renewed and refreshed. And then I get a phone call. Hello? Yeah, we're short staff. Can you come in today? I know you just got out of the hospital. I'll be there in 45 minutes. I went to work. And I went to work because I had something to prove. Because I wanted to become a supervisor. And I wanted to prove to them that no matter what happened, no matter what I battled through, I could, um, I could always be the one they counted on. And so, you know, looking back at that depression, if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would be the person I am today. And today, you're a mental health advocate. You're a suicide prevention advocate. You're a public speaker. You're a podcast host. You've written books. You'd say you're kind of making a place in this world. Yes, ma'am. And you're very humble, too. (laughs) Believe it or not, before depression, I was not humble. Uh, I was the person that said, oh, um, this is how I feel. I don't care how you like it. I don't care if you like me. Uh, It was literally my way or no way. And now it's like, it can't be that way. Well, being a mom of a teenager... I'm going to go out on a limb and say that just might be part of being a teenager. Also, (laughs) some of that. That may be true, too. (laughs) So, Deshaun, tell me about Unscathable. What? So, I said that, that, that is true. We do tend to get rebellious as a teenager. I just never sneaked. It's been said, yes. (laughs) Yeah, I just never sneaked out the house. So. I didn't have a car to sneak out the house at the time. So when I was a There you go. <laughs> and all my friends couldn't drive either. So I had to call their parents if I wanted to go somewhere. <laughs> and it's not in the house that the parents know. <laughs> and I had to, like, had to use a landline phone. So definitely couldn't, definitely couldn't plan nothing. Um, mm. But unscathable, uh, which is soon to be so unscathable is my podcast um which is soon to be rebranded to on the issue and um huh? it's a podcast that focuses originally it was a podcast that was supposed to uh that literally had no sense of direction uh, i just i would book guests and um uh, and we would we would just talk it out um whatever the topic they wanted to discuss and if I felt like it was aligned with me, we discussed it. However, the last umpteenth episodes have seen the biggest drop off in audience. And so I was like, okay, it's time to rebrand. It's time to get serious. Uh, it's almost two years old. So it's time to get real serious about this podcast. So, you know, We're planning, like, I'm planning on changing the name to Own the Issue, and we're going to be talking about um, about things that's going on in society, things that need to be changed, why they're being normalized. So um, 
you know, we're going to be talking about why is, um, why is cheating in society? Why has that been normalized? Uh, why is it, I know this one's going to get a lot of, uh, feedback. Why is the LGBTQ community, uh, look, look down on so much and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm, it's just, uh, and then we're also going to be having episodes, you know, where we're raise, raising awareness on mental health, suicide prevention, gaslighting, domestic abuse, and things of that nature, because I think those, those are the things that are going on in, in society now that aren't being talked about a lot, or they get talked about just enough and then it gets swept up underneath the road. So that's what on. Um, it's so, an inconvenient truth, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and so the whole name of the the new name of the podcast on the issue um, is literally we're on the issue about the issue, and we're gonna fix the issue. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what actually um, inspired the new name for it. That sounds like an amazing podcast. When will On the Issue debut? So On the Issue, um, it because it has to go un- under the rebrand, relaunch, and everything. Um, it was supposed mm-hmm. to it was supposed to launch June first, but I want to go ahead and get that name out there. So I'm thinking after my 25th birthday, uh, which is February the 11th. Um, I think around February, so I don't have a calendar. So the 11th is a Saturday. So on February the 16th is when, um, the new trailer for it will be, uh, put out. And then that's where every week afterward, you'll have a episode and people who have been following me since my very first podcast may notice that um that they are going to hear episodes similar because of being of um shows being repurposed coming from one podcast to another podcast just a name change so mid february watch for on yes, the ma'am. issue and folks it sounds like it's going to be an amazing podcast so make sure you check that out deshaun as we wrap up here I want to give you an opportunity. If there's someone listening to this interview, to this podcast that's struggling, what would you say to them? To the person that's out there struggling, um, always remember, well, I want you to remember this. The things that are happening in your life, they're not happening to you. They're happening for you and they're happening through you. Because at the end of the day, it's going to help you become a better person, but you have to be willing to allow these things to mold you to become the better person, become that person that you desire to be in order to make that impact that you want to see in the world. And that's spoken from a man who knows. Deshaun, thank you so much for being with us today. Congratulations on your pending nuptials whenever you get married. Make sure you let us know. We'd love to give you a little shout out on Pursuing Uncomfortable and celebrate your marriage. And congrats on the new podcast. And we hope that you just go out there and kill it with with all that you're doing. I think your podcast is a needed voice in our society. I'm glad you're doing it. And I think you're just the right person. So thank you. Thank you.